All right, here we go. Uh, hey everyone, I uh, hope you're all doing well. This is uh, the first lecture that we're going to do uh, since we've kind of transitioned to the online world. So um, I hope that you can see this video and um, I hope everything's going well for you, just to say the least. Um, so we're going to talk about speciation today. Um, this was the lecture that was originally planned for Friday. Um, but everything, since classes were canceled on Thursday and Friday, everything's just going to get pushed uh, back one. So we're at speciation, and uh, I think it's going to be a cool lecture, and uh, let's get started. So here we go. Um, did humans evolve from apes? So you may have heard somebody say in the past, well, if, um, if humans evolve from apes, why are there apes still around? And uh, hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to explain to them uh, why that is the case. So um, you can see, did, did, did we evolve from apes? Here I am. Uh, and here is a chimpanzee. And the answer is actually no. Um, chimps, uh, di uh, we didn't evolve from chimps. What the reality is that we share a, what is called a common ancestor. So this little uh, fella here on the bottom is an artist's rendition of what uh, maybe a common ancestor that we once shared with chimpanzees uh, might have looked like. And so we're going to be talking about speciation, and, and the definition of speciation is the evolutionary process by which populations evolve to become distinct species, or basically how we get um, species that we have today, what they might have looked like uh, previously, or and their ancestors might have looked like. So for this to make sense, we need to get our working definition of a species, which actually um, is a little more difficult than you might think because even biologists sometimes argue over what a species uh, definition would be. Um, so for this class we're going to use this uh, definition which is sometimes called the biological species concept um, but there are other sort of arguments for and against it so but for this class this is what we're going to use and that is that a species is any two uh, individuals are members of the same species if they can reproduce and make fertile offspring. So they have to be able to produce offspring and then those offspring have to be able to reproduce and produce offspring. Okay, so that's what we're going to work with um, with our species definition. So let's talk about lions and tigers. So on the left here we've got a male lion and on the right we've got a female tiger. Now individually they are two different species. We know that. We know that lions are species. We know that tigers are species. They are males and females of both. They can produce little lion cubs or little tiger cubs. Um, but maybe what you might not know is that a male lion and a female tiger can mate and they can produce an offspring which is called a liger. And you can see um, on the left here there, here's a liger and next to, a, let's just say that's his mother, um, a tiger. You can see the vast size difference. Now, the tiger is already a huge cat, so the, the size of this liger is really, really impressive. Uh, here, there's another one here on the right. You can see this is a full-grown adult female uh, human, and she is just getting uh, totally uh, covered by this giant cat. Um, now the interesting thing about ligers is that though they are viable as adults, they cannot produce offspring themselves. And so our species definition still works where a lion and a tiger, they each can produce baby lions and they can each produce baby tigers. And they can produce a liger, but those uh, ligers are not, uh, they cannot produce offspring of their own. Okay. Um, so how does speciation occur? Um, speciation occurs, uh, for it to occur, we've got to have something that's called reproductive isolation. And reproductive isolation just basically means that two sets of the species are living in distinct groups where they can't uh, mate with each other. Um, and this happens a number of ways, but when it does occur, uh, we'll see changes take place between the two groups. Um, those changes occur due to mutation. Uh, natural selection, genetic drift, all of the mechanisms of evolution that we've talked about so far, they're going to act upon these two uh, isolated groups of individuals. So the first type of speciation I want to talk about is called allopatric speciation. Uh, if you look up the etymology of the word allopatric, what that means is different fatherland or different country. 
Um, and that's pretty much uh, what we're dealing with. Allopatric speciation means that some geographic barrier separates two populations of a of once uh, similar species, the same species, are separated by a river or a mountain or an ocean. And that causes them to be reproductively isolated, right? That mountain or river causes them, individuals from one group, to be unable to mate with individuals of another group. Um, over time, mutations occur, natural selection acts, genetic drift occurs, the other mechanisms of evolution act upon the two groups such that they can become genetically distinct species. So that's allopatric speciation. One really good example of allopatric speciation that we've already talked about are Darwin's finches. Um, there's about 15 different species of these finches that are, are occur um, on the Galapagos Islands. And it's theorized that one individual uh, species uh, landed on the Galapagos Islands, one of the Galapagos Islands. They then radiated out to all the other islands. Um, and they have each become specialized to that specific island. Um, they've got different uh, beaks for foods which are insects, seeds, flowers. And so um, when you see one species that sort of blossoms into all these different, that's called adaptive radiation. Um, and all that means is that one species sort of becomes a ton of other species that all have a very specific niche or a very specific job that they do. Um, and so this is one uh, example of allopatric speciation where each of these birds is separated by being on different islands. Another example are the squirrels that you find on opposite sides of the Grand Canyon. Um, these guys, A, A over here, he lives on the western side of the Grand Canyon, and B over here lives on the southern side of the Grand Canyon. And so that's that big geographic expanse that they can't cross and get to each other. And so they do look similar, but they're actually genetically distinct, and they don't ever meet, and they don't breed together, so they're considered different species. Okay, so you might think that, you know, in order for this to occur, geographic barriers would always be required in order for speciation to occur. However, uh, with sympatric speciation, that would mean same fatherland or same country, um, this speciation occurs between uh, in, uh, species that are right in the same area. And there's going to be barriers that create reproductive isolation. And the first are the prezygotic barriers. So before a zygote, prezygotic barriers are before a zygote is created. Remember, a zygote is what's created when a sperm and an egg fuse. And then there are post-zygotic barriers, which mean barriers to speciation after a zygote has been uh, formed. And so let's talk about the prezygotic barriers first. Prezygotic barriers are factors that prevent a zygote, uh, which is the fertilized egg, from ever forming. Um, so the first prezygotic barrier that I'd like to talk about is behavioral isolation. And we've seen all those videos uh, that I showed in class of the birds that are singing and dancing um, and building very specific nests uh, and bringing very specific items to their, their potential mate. Um, birds who don't do that specific song and that specific dance or that specific activity um, they're not going to be able to mate, okay? So the females select exactly for the songs of the, the same species. One of the common examples of this that I want to show you is the eastern and the western meadowlark. So let's take a look at that. So the eastern and the western meadowlark, you can see, look <laughs> almost identical, right? Very, very similar. Um, when you look up what are the true differences in, in visual, still some will say, well, the Eastern has a bit more white in the tail. And so I think you'd have to be really trained uh, by the eye to really uh, get it visually. But what's totally different about these two is the song that they sing. Um, the song of the Eastern and the Western meadowlark is so distinct that the females of one species will not mate with males of another species. And so if you never thought about that, you'd look at these two birds and you'd say, definitely the same species, but really they're not, and it's because of behavioral isolation. The next thing I want to talk about in terms of prezygotic barriers is something that's called temporal isolation or time isolation. Some species can't mate with each other simply because of the time that they're ready to mate. The It doesn't match up with the other species. So uh, the eastern and the western skunk, uh, spotted skunk, these are kind of rare little guys, but they're pretty cute looking. Um, 
They can't mate because the eastern spotted skunks breed, uh, breed near the end of winter, so early spring, and the western one breeds in the late uh, summer in the autumn. And so those are two temporally isolated species. And so they look very similar, but they're never ready to breed at the same time. And so they only breed with themselves. And that uh, is exactly uh, following the definition of species. The final one I want to talk about, the uh, final uh, isolation I want to talk about in terms of prezygotic barriers is called habitat isolation. And uh, basically what that means is if two species of uh, amphibian might live in the same area, but one prefers an aquatic environment and another prefers a ter terrestrial environment or being on the land, they will not mate, right? It's pretty obvious. If they're not living in the same uh, sort of environment, uh, they're going to be isolated from each other. And this species of, sn of snake, uh, Thymnopsis, I'm going to call them Thymnopsis, um, the one of them it lives in the aquatic environment in the water and the other lives on the land and so these two will never breed together and they become their own separate species the aquatic water dweller and the terrestrial version so it's habitat isolation so finally i want to talk about post zygotic barriers and these are the barriers that prevent two species from producing viable viable offspring after fertilization has occurred so um they can have intercourse, they can, a sperm can bind with the egg, but there are specific barriers that occur that uh, prevent those two from becoming the same species. The first is our liger example. The liger can be produced. It can be a full healthy individual, but two ligers cannot continue to produce ligers. And so with that, we say that the lion and the tiger are still uh, genetically uh, distant uh, genetically uh, distinct uh, species. Okay. Other times, offspring can be produced, but their health will not allow them to survive to adulthood. So that's kind of different from the liger, where their health is fine. They can. Um, I won't say they're always fine. Sometimes they're uh, they're not as healthy as um, a adult lion or an adult tiger, um, and they do have some of some genetic problems like that growth. It seems to never stop, which can be a problem for them. Um, but sometimes you can produce babies uh, with a hybrid baby. So a hybrid is two species creating another, like a liger is a hybrid. Um, sometimes offspring can be produced, but their health will not allow them to survive to adulthood. So if they're never surviving to adulthood, they don't even have the chance to try and reproduce. And so we can't call them a species. And finally, um, a zygote might be produced where a sperm and an egg might join together. Um, but it won't develop into a fetus because genetically they're just not viable, right? There's at some point the genes, the chromosomes that have the genes, they're just not going to be similar enough to produce something that can uh, turn into a fetus and then eventually be born uh, as a baby. Um, and so the zygote was formed, but it never produced, it never turned into uh, an adult. Okay. So that's uh, uh, it for our slideshow today. I will also post this in text form and I will post uh, the slideshow itself if you want to download it uh, for your own. The best way that I would suggest going about this is to watch these videos exactly at the time that you would normally be in class. So remember our class started at two o'clock and went to 2.50. So maybe take uh, that time during your week to watch the video. What I would do is watch my video, take notes while you're watching the video, maybe watch it again, fill back in the notes uh, so that you've got a really good uh, list of things that I, that I talked about in this video. Then maybe take a break, then come back and download the slideshow like you normally would for class. Go through, make sure your notes are 100% are correct with everything that we went over in the, in the uh, slideshow, and I think you should be good. Uh, keep a lookout for more uh, announcements that I'm going to throw up onto the Canvas site uh, in terms of uh, activities for lab, because we're still going to have to figure that out, and uh, the exam. So uh, if there's any questions, please feel free to email me. I'm going to be checking that all the time, um, and uh, best of luck. So I'll see you soon.